Adrian Ann Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, May 6, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting work sessions on Project HOPE and IJAG's City Life presentation. Thank you, good evening, and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for May 6, 2024. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Jones. Here. Resnick. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Wethel. Here. City Manager Van Milligan. Here. And City Attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you. Our first work session topic is the Project HOPE update. I will turn it over to the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque's Alex Baum. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Mayor Kavanaugh, the council members, uh, Mike and staff, thank you so much for allowing me to, to come here and present to you today. Really excited for this update on the work that we've been doing with Project HOPE. Um, since we were able to last present to you. Um, I I'll warn you, this is a pretty meaty presentation. There is a lot of uh, data and information that I wanted to move, so I'm going to move through this, but please um, let me know if you have any questions or feel free to always reach out to me afterwards. Um, I wanted to start with uh, an update on the Alice Survival Budget. This is some numbers that we've been working on with the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support, who have been great partners with this, and is lo really looking at what is a survival level budget, uh, a cost of living here in the city of Dubuque. These are the most recent updated numbers using 2023 numbers where available and 2022 um, census data. And you can see that uh, for a single adult, it's about $25,000 a year. For uh, a single parent with one child, about $46,000 a year. And for a family of four, we're looking at about eighty-five and a half thousand a year, um, and we've included here the percent of the population that kind of falls below that Alice threshold in each of those categories. Now we have a lot more data. I'm not going to go through this too much, but we've also kind of mapped out how each of those different indicators and parts of the budget change. You can see, for example, uh, how housing costs have shot up within Dubuque over the past year, which I don't think is uh, particularly surprising to any of us, um, but that has impacted the budget. Um, we also are trying to look at breaking it down by race and ethnicity to see, you know, what are the disparities within our community. Uh, I should state that unlike the general population data, um, we're not able to break this out by household type for each of these populations. So this is just the percent of the population that falls below each of these thresholds. Uh, in general, uh, these numbers have improved since the last time that we've talked. Um, so, you know, for black, Latino, Pacific Islander, Asian, generally the numbers are, are better than they have been in the past, but you can see that there's still a number of disparities when it comes to different populations within our community. But moving on from that, I wanted to present some other data that we've been looking at in terms of Project HOPE around nonprofit organizations within Dubuque. Uh, this comes from IRS data. They have a 501c3 database that's actually held by the Urban Institute. Um, and I've been going through the numbers, and we have technically for 2022, the most recent year, 690 nonprofit organizations in Dubuque County, which is a good amount, <laughs> I would say uh, certainly above average for a population our size. Um, over half of those have an income below $50,000 a year, which is kind of important to consider. And when we look here at those nonprofit organizations and their income based on when, how long ago they were founded, you can see a lot of the more recently founded organizations tend to have that income below 50,000. And it's not until you get to 10 to 20 years, 20 to 50 years, that you get a higher percentage with a larger income level. Looking at that income breakdown, also we were very interested in looking at for what reasons nonprofit organizations in our community close. What causes them to, to shut down? So here is a graph showing closed nonprofit organizations by their year since they were founded. So from closing the same year that they were founded to closing 81 years after they were founded. And this is all closures within the past 10 years, a 10 year period here. 
If we break this down by quartile, you can see that a quarter of those nonprofit organizations close within six years, and about half of them it's within 18 years. So there's a pretty significant number of organizations that close fairly soon after they've started. Looking at it in another way, you know, from the number of organizations that have been created each year and closed, uh, within the past three years, that 2020, 21, 21, and 2022 years, there have obviously been more closures than there have been new organizations founded, in large part due to the pandemic. But overall, during this period, we see a lot more nonprofit organizations getting started than we see shutting down. This is a trend around our region and something that's been going on and, and, and leads me to some research that has been put together by a researcher from the University of Minnesota named Ben Winchester who has been looking at these changes in civic engagement in rural areas. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about his, how his research and our data kind of reinforce each other. Now, one of the things you can do with this IRS data is look at what type of organizations you have in your community. So this is a lot of data, but it's just to show that we're able to break these different organizations down by what their focus area is. Now, if we look at kind of nonprofit organizations that were founded in the last 10 years and those that were founded more than 25 years ago, the biggest change, the biggest difference is that now you are seeing a lot more organizations that are recreation, sports, and leisure, and athletics, and a lot fewer mutual benefit organizations and membership organizations. So for example, these are you know, the Dubuque Figure Skating Club uh, as opposed to Knights of Columbus organizations. These are kind of some of the examples. What this shows is how the civic engagement within our community has been changing over this period of time. It's not going away. Remember, we are getting more and more nonprofit organizations that we've ever had, but this data shows how it has been changing. It's moving from these place-based, word-of-mouth kind of general organizations like your Rotary Clubs, which were really a center of civic engagement 25 years ago and more, and moving to much more specifically defined, maybe broader geographically nonprofit organizations that are, uh, people are getting connected to through the internet. And so that level of civic engagement is, is not decreasing, but it is changing. And I think it's important for us to think about what this might mean for our community, what are the benefits of this change, and obviously what are some of the things that we may be losing as this change takes place. Now the second thing I want to talk about in terms of this is the leadership demands. This is something that Ben looks at a lot. So we have 690 nonprofit organizations. So Ben Winchester said, what if you, every board on average has six people? How many people do you need to run your city, to run your place? So with 690 nonprofit organizations, that means one in every 18 adults needs to be on a board seat, basically. Now this is a lot lower or higher ratio, right? A, a lot more adults that you need in Iowa than in other parts of the country, Florida, Texas, New York, California. You don't see nearly this level of requirement for engagement. But we went a little bit beyond what his research was and looked at, well, if you're talking about people of color, right, the communities of color within our community, what would the requirements for them? So with 690 nonprofit organizations, if you just had one person of color on the board of each of those, that's one in every 10.7 adults. And for like our black community, it would be one in every 2.8, and Latino, one in 2.3. Now obviously that's not how it happens. It's not one person can only serve on one board and some boards don't have a diverse board. But I think it does reinforce the, uh, what a lot of us suspect about the requirements being placed on leadership from a lot of these communities and the demand out there for people to be able to serve on boards. It's why you see somebody uh, who has a lot of influence and connection in our community serving on a lot of different boards is because of this demand versus the supply that we have available. But another question that this raises is, does it limit civic entrepreneurship? If there is this demand for leadership connected to existing nonprofit organizations, does that mean that there is less ability for people to be able to pursue their own initiatives? 
And so out of these 690 nonprofits, I actually went by in hand and tried to Google search as many as I could. I found seven that I was able to identify that were centered within diverse and underserved communities and that were serving those communities. Now that is not an exact number. There may be some things I've missed. There are some organizations that are founded in 2023 that are here, and there are some organizations with their headquarters outside of the county that might not be captured, but it's a pretty good reflection of the limited number of nonprofits that we have within these communities, which I think explains why you often hear the same requests going to the same organizations. So take away 690 nonprofit organizations uh, reflecting a, a changing civic engagement, not in a declining one, but over a, a quarter of those nonprofits close within six years of founding, and we have a lack of diverse representation in terms of board leadership and nonprofit organizations. So how does this all connect with Project Hope? Well, with Project Hope, we have decided to, to move forward with a focus on community empowerment building. And here's what I mean by that, right? We've often heard that Dubuque is a resource-rich but connection poor community. So we have great service providers, impactful programs, well paying jobs, but we struggle to be able to connect members of those underserved communities to those researches. That's where we're having challenges. And, and I think the disparities that we looked at before with the Alice data reflect this. What are the reasons for that? I think there's a lot that we can talk about. I list a couple here. You know, Dubuque has undergone some pretty significant rapid demographic change within the last 25 years, and so there hasn't been time within a lot of communities, you think of our Marshallese community, to build those long roots and networks that would be necessary for that kind of power base. Um, I, I also want to point out the importance of relationships, right? I uh, had my laundry have sewage back up into it due to a blocked pipe a few weeks ago. And when I needed somebody to be able to climb, clean it out and tear up the floor, um, I didn't do a Google search. I asked my mother-in-law, right? It, it's often relationships and who we know within Dubuque that allow us to get things done. And that's terrific. I mean, it, it's one of the reasons I love this community but can it, it can also be a barrier to newcomers who don't necessarily have those relationships established. So from trust issues to culturally competent communication, we, we have a number of different barriers that are keeping us from successfully connecting underserved populations to available resources, which means that we have a big reliance on community connectors. That's how we do it. It's those individuals or nonprofit organizations who have the cultural knowledge and the linguistic knowledge and the relationships to be able to serve that connection. And these leaders are amazing. They do amazing work, but this kind of situation leads to a number of challenges, ranging from bottlenecks due to limited capacity. If you're relying on volunteers who have a nine to five job, there's only so much they can do to be able to connect communities. Uh, vulnerability is also a huge issue that I wanna bring up. One of those nonprofit organizations out of the seven, Key City Pride, was a fantastic organization serving the LBGTQ population. Um, lot of, of hope for that organization and proud of what they were doing. And then one day it seemed like they disappeared. And why was that? I think, believe it was because of an interpersonal conflict between two of the founders, right? That was a promising organization that due to its newness and its lack of professionalism and resources was in a very vulnerable state where something like that could you know, break apart a lot of good work that had been done over the past couple of years. That vulnerability, we've heard similar stories within the Marshallese community, Latino community, a lot of other places. So when we kind of think about these challenges, what we come to is that the leaders Dubuque most relies on for that connection to underserved population, they are frequently under-resourced, they are underconnected. often they are under-trained in the systems that they work with, and they are very vulnerable to disruption. 
And so that leads us to what we're hoping Project Hope's role to be, which is to provide targeted support to some of those community-based organizations, to be able to bolster that capacity and remove that vulnerability. So the idea would be to engage with community-based organizations, to incorporate them more fully into Project Hope, and to provide support through sustainability, connection, and leadership. Um, I've actually included an initial kind of table of different projects that we're looking at and what activities could look like. But I want to make clear, I don't feel like an expert necessarily in this realm and what would be required to be able to really successfully get a small nonprofit organization up to the point where it is sustainable and can last beyond those initial shocks which is why we're actually partnering with the Office of Shared Prosperity and have joined uh, the Urban Institute Mobility Action Learning Network. So this is a cohort run by the Urban Institute um, where we are focusing specifically on this engagement, right? How can we bring the, the resources and the academic knowledge throughout the country and direct it at this question, right? How can we better support those grassroots organizations? I actually think this is a, a fantastic partnership with the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support because their work with neighborhood organization, associations and with that kind of community engagement building, that's one of the key things that is bringing within communities this level of connection and engagement and power building that we really need. And so we're hoping to be able to do that with smaller nonprofit organizations as well. So some of the initial group, groups we're, we're meeting with, uh, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Group, uh, CAOC, which is the Marshallese Women's Group, we've been working with very closely. We're trying to help the tri-state VIATs with their transition to having a primarily Guatemalan run organization. Um, and there have also been multiple groups that have approached us recently about creating a Marshallese Welcome Center, or what could a nonprofit look like there? So we're very initial stages here, but this is, I wanted to share a little bit with what some of our priorities are and what some of our focuses are. In addition to that, I want to try to briefly update you about the Better Together Committee and the other work that's being done specifically with immigrant communities in this area. So as some of you remember, last time we presented about the immigration community assessment and some of the research that we've been conducting. And one of the key findings was, from this was that we needed a, um, a way to collaborate at a strategic level as a community and try to address some of the systemic challenges facing immigrant populations. And from that, we founded the Better Together Committee in August, which is composed of about 60 plus stakeholders, about 30% of whom are from immigrant populations and include a lot of committed members of the city as well, who are fantastic partners and really helping move things forward. And out of this work, we have identified six different priority areas that we are working on and trying to achieve. And so I just want to provide brief updates on these six different activities. Uh, the first one has to do with helping employers better hire and retain members of immigrant populations. Uh, I don't know if you remember last time I presented on some MIT research that was done in this area through our partnership with MIT about some of the challenges that we can have with cultural competency and getting people connected. So we have moved forward with developing a toolkit from employers and trying to build a consultant capacity. We're actually working with NICC on this and getting a consultant who is trained and will be able to go in with companies and help them make these changes. We're building connections between community members and employers, and we're hoping to employ uh, or to hold an employer summit where we roll all of this out maybe later in the year. Uh, our second priority area is working on trying to retain international students. We have some fantastic colleges and universities here with great pipelines for international students, and we struggle with being able to retain them due to the bureaucratic needs and the administrative burden that comes with our federal immigration system. So we have actually been working with MIT again. Um, they are going to be providing us a report later this month specifically about this issue, but we're also working to try to demystify the process and then support both employers and students so that we can have a local capacity to make this as easy as possible. We want to get our student retention up 
above, to the national average where you would expect it to be or beyond that, hopefully. We want to make it a strength instead of a weakness. Uh, I think a number of you have heard about the need for uh, medical translation and interpretation, certified medical interpreters within our community. We have a significant lack of them um, in both Spanish and especially Marshallese. Um, and what that means is that often there are untrained community members or even children translating at individuals' medical appointments, which is a heartbreaking situation. Um, and even in those situations where it is a, a community leader, they're not able to be compensated in most cases because they are not certified. While things like language line and other pieces of technology are, are part of the puzzle, what we've heard from community members are they're not quite sufficient for, for our needs. And so we are moving forward with training and certifying 20 Spanish-speaking and 20 Marshallese-speaking community members. Um, getting them trained, getting them certified, and then creating a database to connect them with healthcare providers. Uh, we've actually applied for a number of grants and are really moving forward with a number of these areas and are hoping to see a lot of results in the near future. Uh, another priority is to be able to hire additional navigators. We have some fantastic navigators within our community. If you think of the Visiting Nurse Association and Nikki Lenja and the uh, Crescent Community Health Center, some amazing work being done there. But what we're looking at is where do we need more navigators to be able to help immigrant communities understand the systems that we have. Uh, a priority area we're looking at is a Marshallese individual at NICC for their Opportunity Debut Program. And then also, can we support those navigators that exist so that burnout and some of these other issues become less of a concern? And we're looking at starting an affinity group for those navigators. Finally, this is a, a new issue that I want to bring up. We've decided to try to address chronic absenteeism, which is when a student in our school district misses at least 10% of their school days, and it's, the evidence seems to show that it is a significant indicator of worse educational outcomes, including much lower graduation rates and other challenges. As you can see, at the Dubuque Community School District, over a third of all students are currently considered chronically absent. But when you look at our Pacific Islander students, that number shoots up to 77%. Now, this wasn't initially one of our priorities, but when we saw that number, we decided we needed to, to start a new subcommittee focused primarily on this. And so we've actually been partnering with the University of Iowa College of Law. Um, some students there, I, I don't know who is at the presentations on Thursday, but you might have seen them giving a presentation on this issue. They, we just this afternoon went over some of their uh, initial draft of their final report, which I'm very excited about. And we're gonna be moving forward with things like expanding student engagement, getting parents better connected to the work that's going on, and also trying to get teachers and staff at the school district engaged in some of those community celebrations and organizations so they can feel better connected with the community. Uh, finally, some of you may have mentioned, noticed a green box. This is an internal subcommittee. We really recognize that the Better Together Committee with 30% of participants being from immigrant uh, populations is probably not ideally suited for them to be able to express themselves and have the kind of leadership and ownership that we want. And so this committee is itself just focused on continually making improvements to how we allow our immigrant participants to be able to take leadership and move forward and be able to participate within the organization, realizing that we're never gonna get perfect, but if we keep working at it, we'll get better and better. Uh, thank you all so much. I know that was a lot of information, but I, I uh, appreciate the time, and I would like to um, see if you have any questions. Sure. You really did pack a lot in there, Alex. Thank you very much. <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was a fascinating presentation, so thank you. Um, we have time for probably two, maybe like one or two questions here, so open it up. Yeah, please yourself. Thank you. Um, my question is, how do you find those immigrant participants? If you want to increase those numbers, how are you going to find them? Well, that's a fantastic question, and part of what that committee is focused on. Um, we've got pretty good representation from, say, our, our Latino population and our Marshallese population, though it could always be better. But I know there are a number of other 
communities where maybe we don't have as many. For example, there is a Southeast Asian community in Dubuque that I haven't had many engagements with, and it would be great to be able to build some of that. So uh, that's really part of how that committee is going to work, identifying where we are missing people and then devising a plan for moving forward. Honestly, I don't have all the solutions for what that will take, but we want to make sure that we are as inclusive of the needs, that we are not leaving anybody out of this conversation as we move forward. That's great to hear. Thank you. So the translator program I'm really <laughs> impressed with. Um, the, I, I'm, I have the privilege to serve on the um, Dubuque Early Childhood um, board and as part of that we get to meet monthly with folks at the VNA about their needs and what they're doing for our community and specifically um, for our immigrant community just even updating childhood immunizations is a big deal and they recently lost their sole Spanish speaker and as their employee and so they have to double the time of each individual family's visit if they do not speak English because the translation line is so time consuming to bring it up and then to utilize it one-on-one -on -one with a pretty complex situation, which is educating patients and their families on vaccine reactions and why we do vaccines. It's, it's a lot of education to do over a screen. So my question is, how are you going to distribute these um, and I don't mean distribute, I guess that sounds really kind of <laughs> strange, but how, how will you help to connect these folks with specific organizations? And is there a priority list of what organizations should um, have this list um, and priority of them? Uh, it's a great question. It's one, um, so we are working on building out a database that's based on some of the different interpreter databases that we've seen at a state level. Um, but honestly, we want to add some improvements to, to you know, be transparent about that. There are certain challenges with trying to create a database, even of certified interpreters. Um, how do you help those interpreters decide on rates and usages? How are you making sure you're connecting with not just healthcare providers, which is the priority, but businesses who would love to have a Marshall East interpreter be able to translate safety material, or uh, the school district, or NICC. There's a lot of instances where having that list of interpreters could be valuable. Also, how do you provide quality control, right? If there is an interpreter who is maybe having challenges or is not acting as I can, is there a place where you can contact back to that? So we'll be working on building the database and making sure it gets distributed, but we also want to find a sustainable home for the database where we can add new individuals as they come in, but also be able to, um, you know, be able to provide some degree of quality um, response to the needs of the community and of interpreters as they come in. I don't have an exact plan for that right now, um, but it's one of the focus areas that this subcommittee is going to have once we start getting those individuals trained. Wonderful. Thanks for the work. Yeah. Well, last quick question. We have uh, about a minute left here, Alex. So it sounds to me like, so Project Hope has been around for a long time, but there's a change in, in mission here. You're, you're changing your goal um, in what you're trying to accomplish. So is it is it really, you're focusing more now on these connections and connecting, um, you, you said, you know, the proposal I'm reading, you're providing targeted support and, and connections to community-based organizations will equi equitably bolster delivery of services. Is that kind of the, the newest focus? Yeah, project? absolutely. Project Hope has always had kind of two elements. There's been one, connecting and bringing together different stakeholders around economic mobility and poverty reduction, right? And that is still a role we will always continue to play and a big part of it. So being able to respond to new situations, being able to help answer questions and direct people, and just have larger connection conversations about those issues. But Project Hope has also often had a specific focus area uh, that's ranged from you know, the creation of the Opportunity Dubuque program, uh, the ALICE research that we did, that was a priority area because it was a priority area for the Office of Shared Prosperity. And so once we got that set up, we said, what is a new kind of focus area, a project that we want to be working on? 
And this, our, our research and our conversations seem to indicate was a, a gap in the community that we felt we could provide some assistance to. Well, thank you very much. And, and that's, that's incredibly enlightening to understand the, the changing and evolving mission, I guess you could say. So I really appreciate that. Um, and very much appreciate this, this presentation here tonight. It's good to make sure that we're staying up to date and providing that to everybody else who's able to tune in. Well, thank you so much. And if there are any other questions, or I know we have limited time with, with what I fit in, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and contact me. I'd be more than happy to talk about this. All right. Thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you very much.